Hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, we're going to wait a few seconds here as everyone starts to get logged on. Uh, and it should take uh, a few minutes for the screen to come up for you. Wonderful. OK, welcome to another monthly installment of our Meet the VC series. Uh, we've been doing these for years, uh, not always online, um, but uh, for the last few months online, and we're really excited uh, about the one me personally today. Uh, I'm your host today. So my name is Dan Dato, uh, and I'm the CMO at Early Growth. Uh, I'm coming to you today from Santa Monica, California, and our VC is also Southern California based, which is why I'm so excited. Um, just a little bit about me. Um, I'm, I'm one of you. Uh, I'm an entrepreneur first and foremost. Uh, I've been involved in half a dozen venture-backed companies, raised a ton of venture capital, lost a bit along the way, made a bit along the way. Um, overall, uh, been having fun along the journey. Um, and uh, for today's webinar, just a few uh, ground rules. As you come in, um, feel free to introduce yourself via the chat. Um, when you do so, make sure that you're chatting, not just to the panelists, but to all panelists att and attendees, uh, and tell us who you are. Give us the name of your company, a one sentence description, a link, whether it's a company link or a LinkedIn link. Um, when we do these in person, and hopefully that'll be uh, soon that we start doing that again, um, the networking that we have is, is probably the most fun that we have with these events. And, and so let's see if we can do that in the chat room. So again, make sure that you're chatting uh, to all panelists and attendees, not just to the panelists. Uh, and, and I'll remind you guys as you're coming, as you're coming in and going on, uh, that chat room, we can ask uh, questions of each other. But if you have questions for uh, our, our moderator or our VC, please use the Q&A functionality. That's what we're gonna be keeping an eye on uh, for questions. So if you put them in the chat, they get lost in the discussion. So if you have questions for either Mike or Josh, please use the, the Q&A. Uh, we're gonna go for about an hour here. We might go into overtime as well if you have time to stick around, um, but uh, it's being recorded. So if you have to leave, uh, we will be following up uh, likely tomorrow or the next day uh, once we're able to get the video up on YouTube with links so that you can come back and watch it. Uh, really quickly, most of you know about early growth. What, what some of you may not know about early growth uh, is we recently merged with Escalon Services. Uh, very, very exciting. We're still going about getting that announcement out. It just happened a few weeks ago. Um, but, but early growth and Escalon shared the same mission. I mean, we help take care of the, the business services, the essential business services that you need to do behind the scenes so you can focus on your team, your customers, and growing your own business. And early growth, it had been the entire finance stack. Now that it's Escalon and early growth together, uh, it covers more than just finance and accounting. It actually, we can help early stage companies with HR, business insurance, just everything that's happening in the back office so that you can focus. Um, early growth had been around for a dozen years. Escalon had also been around for a dozen years. Um, and one of the exciting things about the merger is we now have a true global footprint. Um, so, so the result is we can do more things for more people. Um, and we've helped some, some pretty amazing companies along the way, whether you're just getting started or you're getting ready to IPO, uh, Escalon Early Growth can help along that entire journey. Uh, what happens today doesn't happen alone. Uh, we have a number of partners. Early Growth hopes to be a partner of your startup and, and Early Growth also has its own partners that help to put these events together and to promote them. Uh, so today, uh, we have a few that I'm going to invite in here to uh, give a quick introduction. So let me um, very quickly uh, ask our first uh, partner here, which is um, Perkins Cooey. Uh, Arian Galavis, uh, your video and audio should be turned on now. Coming on, there we go. Hey everybody, uh, my name is Arian Galavis. I'm a counsel here at Perkins Coie. 
Um, our emerging companies and venture capital group represents startup companies from formation through what we hope is a very successful exit. Um, as part of that representation, we advise companies on matters that are truly fundamental to their businesses, including capital raising, IP protection and licensing, navigating regulatory regimes, equity compensation, and hopefully, you know, the exit strategy as well. Um, we have over 100 attorneys that specialize in the practice on a nationwide basis, uh, including hotspots in Seattle, the Bay Area, Portland, New York, and most recently, Austin. Um, we strive to be business oriented and practical in our approach so that founders can focus on operating their businesses. Um, very much looking forward to the conversation today uh, and welcome the opportunity to learn more about all the businesses represented here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, Perkins is one of those top tier legal firms that when you look at their client list, it kind of blows your mind. Uh, and, and so you want to surround yourself with A players. Perkins is definitely one of those. Uh, we got another A player coming up, Kyle Swan, uh, Silicon Valley Bank. Kyle? Hey, thanks everybody for having us here. We're excited to be a part of it and help kind of build the ecosystem out. So, you know, SVB has been supporting entrepreneurs and their equity sponsors for over 35 years now. We've got 37 U.S. offices and worldwide presence, uh, so we can be everywhere that you need to be. Um, you know, happy to answer any questions kind of after the event and see how we can be useful and helpful. Awesome. Kyle, thanks for helping us out. SVB is a regular partner of ours for these events. Uh, and part of the reason why they're a regular partner is because they are probably the player uh, in the banking space uh, when it comes to startups. So it's wonderful to have you guys involved. Um, next up, maybe someone that you haven't heard of. Perkins Coie and, and SVB, a lot of people in the startup ecosystem have heard of them. However, that doesn't mean that there's not A players that you haven't heard of. And Reverb, I think, is one of those when it comes to helping to manage your people. So Michaela, welcome. Hey, thank you so much. Uh, we love Perkins and SVB and great to be here and join everyone today. Um, so Reverb is a Seattle-based boutique HR consulting firm. We've been around for just under six years now. Um, we basically do three things. We do HR consulting, leadership development, and executive coaching, um, primarily with startups and scale-ups. And no matter what service we're providing, our goal is to help leaders create the healthy, inclusive culture that's going to help you scale and succeed. So um, really nice to be here. I look forward to chatting with everyone after the session. Thanks, Michaela. It, it's critical as you, as you build your company um, that you've got a healthy culture growing that you're focusing on your team. So while early growth Escalon is helping to make sure that some of the back office services like your finance um, and your insurance is in place, we're working with a company like Reverb to make sure that your, your people are healthy, happy, compensated, critical. Um, thanks, Michaela. Uh, next up, another one of our regular partners that, that many of you, if you haven't been on these webinars, might not know of, but as an entrepreneur, you better get to know them and that's Lighter Capital. Um, when you're out there raising capital to be able to do so and, and not dilute uh, your ownership uh, and keep your cap table uh, kind of in, in place is a wonderful thing. So Zach, why don't you tell us a little bit about Lighter? Hey, everybody. Really excited for today's session and to be here partnered with um, such a great group. Um, real quick about Lighter, we're an earlier stage growth capital provider, um, usually working with startups that are generating revenue, you know, in the 15 to 20K monthly range and up, especially those that haven't received institutional um, equity yet. Um, in that regard, um, you know, this is uh, non-dilutive capital, as Dan was kind enough to point out, and really about helping companies, you know, maximize their valuation when they go to raise or to help bootstrap companies grow a little faster. So thanks for having us. Thanks, Zach. And again, Lighter is another regular partner of ours in putting these together, and we really appreciate their efforts. Um, Okay, last but certainly not least, um, and, and if you notice, all our partners have a, have a Pacific Northwest flair to them, and that's because our moderator today, Mike Lilly, is based up in Portland. And today we have a very, um, our final partner is very, very much about the Pacific Northwest. Um, Nick, uh, feel free to come in off of, off of uh, mute here and tell us a little bit about WTIA. Sure. Uh, hey, everyone. Thanks for, for having us and excited to to see the event. Um, so Washington Technology Industry Association, uh, we're a nonprofit here in Washington State that supports the tech industry and tech companies. Um, in the time I've been here, we've grown from 10 people to 60. So we're now the 
largest tech association in the country. Um, but we, so we work with companies from startups to enterprise, but for startups, you know, our goal is provide stage appropriate resources from health insurance to introductions to various product discounts, a bunch of different things. Uh, and we do free memberships for startups. So I'll stick my email in the chat. And if you want to connect further, uh, just let me know. But otherwise, yeah, looking forward to the event. Awesome, Nick, thanks so much. One, one question for you. If, if you're not from the Pacific Northwest, if you're not from Washington, can you still get involved in your community or is it focused geographically? Yeah, good question. Um, so yeah, we're doing more regional, national and international work as well. We're actually in the middle of a accelerator with 10 Canadian companies, just wrapped one up with South Korea a couple of weeks ago. Um, so yeah, if you're not in the Pacific Northwest, but are interested in Washington state, then yeah, for sure we can be a resource. If you're not planning to do any business here, then probably not so much. But um, if you're not sure, feel free to reach out and happy to chat more about individual circumstances. Awesome. Thanks, Nick. Hey, I'm in Southern California and I'm biased. I know our VC is biased, but Washington State is a great place to do business. Yeah, I went to college in SoCal. So low personal great. income tax and it's a great place to start a company as well if you're thinking about where to start one. Uh, thanks, Nick. Okay, I'm going to come back here and uh, attempt to share my screen one more time real quickly um, and just take us through a very quick introduction. Um, but before I do the introduction, uh, we do have a promo running. Um, this time of year is a time to get your taxes in order. Uh, deadlines come up in April. Even if you're extending, you want to get some help uh, in, in doing that. And the tax practice at early growth is just off the charts stellar. Uh, so you can go to earlygrowth.com ta slash tax promo to learn more. Um, Okay, let's uh, let's do a quick poll while I do my introduction here, just so we understand who's in the room with us today. Uh, I'm going to guess that we've got um, uh, uh, close to 140 people with us today. So let's see how this how this comes out. Typically, uh, about half to a quarter of our folks uh, are are raising a seed round or a Series A. Uh, and that's kind of where we're at today. I'm going to give this just a few more seconds. Uh, but in the meantime, I'm going to start to introduce uh, our host today, Mike Lilly. Mike's been with Early Growth forever um, and, and started down here in L.A. So he's got some L.A. connections to, to our market and our VC as well. Um, but, but now is our West Coast sales director and, and leads up the Pacific Northwest as well. All right, let's end this poll. I think we got most of the people voted in here and share the results for everyone. Mike, you want to come in and, and join us and, and yeah. take over and and give a quick intro uh, of yourself and and uh, our VC today. Yeah, you, you said it better than I could have, Dan. But uh, I love I love what we do at Early Growth now, S one, and and working with early stage companies and helping them uh, through the fundraising process is a big part of that. And so you know, beyond our, our service offering, it's really how do we actually make that fundraising process uh, a lot more transparent, hopefully. And one of the goals with that is doing meet the VCs. And so <clears throat> this is a really special one, <clears throat> excuse me, just because uh, Upfront is, and Josh probably won't say it, but Upfront is, is world-class. It's, they're one of the best uh, VCs in the entire world. And so uh, I've gotten the pleasure to, to know Josh in the last 24 hours. And so got to see the wetsuit there in the back and, and had that nostalgia feel back to, uh, to LA. So really excited for this. And, uh, should be really great. Um, you know, as, as, uh, and then maybe Josh, you can kind of come off on, uh, online too here just to, uh, to go over your background a little bit, and then we can maybe dive into, uh, into the, the firm's parameters and kind of the background and upfront as well. Sounds great, Mike. Um, and first and foremost, Dan and Mike really appreciate you guys having me. Um, it is a joy to speak with you all today. Um, but yeah, I'll give a quick introduction on myself, maybe a really quick primer on upfront and we can kind of dive into it. Um, so hi, everyone. I'm Josh Mittler. I'm an associate at the investment team at Upfront. Um, we're based in Santa Monica. We have an office there, and I'm based in Venice Beach. That's both pre-COVID, during COVID, and post-COVID. So we are very much long LA. Um, but a little bit on my background, I actually was born and raised in Hong Kong. Um, my, my dad's from Sacramento, so I've got ties to California. That's what ultimately brought me here for college. I was born and raised in Hong Kong and spent most of my, um, most of my upbringing um, basically in China and Hong Kong. Uh, my mother's Chinese, actually. Um, but I ended up coming to sunny California for undergrad. Um, and right after that, joined a, um, a consulting firm based here in Los Angeles. 
did that for about three years and joined the team here at Upfront summer of 2018. Um, and so Upfront Ventures, we are an early stage venture capital fund. We've been in Los Angeles for a while now. Um, we're actually on fund number six, uh, but we've been in Los Angeles probably since the late 90s um, as a different permutation of the fund. Uh, but we're early stage investors. Um, we are usually the first institutional money in, in, in a round. And so the way that we think about it is we more often than not lead our investments. That's an average check size of let's say three to $5 million. Um, but we really invest across categories, geographies. Um, but yeah, we're based here in Los Angeles. We are along LA, but we invest, um, I would say nationally and sometimes globally as well. That's awesome. Appreciate that, Josh. And then in terms of your background too, like what ultimately led you to, to upfront too, right? And so I, I know you've, you've got that management consulting background, but you know, you probably, you probably had your pick of the litter too. And so, <clears throat> you know, what, why upfront and, 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 you know, just the background there as well is always great. Yeah, totally. Um, my intention actually was originally to work at a, at a tech startup. I had left McKinsey and I was pretty much set on, I had, un, uh, had some opportunity to, work um, uh, as a consultant as, for professional services for pretty large organizations, right? Um, and I thought the other side of the coin seems really interesting. Early, agile, fast moving. Um, and so my, my original source was actually, I was living out of a suitcase Monday through Thursday, um, working <laughs> in consulting and I, just, I was just sick of it. Yeah. I remember like having a, I remember having a suitcase and needing to have enough space so that when I got off the plane in Chicago in December, I could put on a jacket. And then when I landed in Los Angeles, I didn't melt and I had to take my jacket off and put it in the suitcase. Um, but I, yeah, I was really looking at LA tech, actually. I wanted to be in Los Angeles. I was looking at technology. And what I realized is Venture would have, w was an incredible platform to just understand technology in general. And Venture Capital is extremely regional. Um, and so I wanted something that would be beneficial for the, the fact that I wanted to stay in Los Angeles and that, you know, I'm, I'm pretty long LA and I wanted to build connections here. And so that's really what led me to first venture and then upfront. I think what led me to upfront is um, first and foremost, it's early stage, which I found pretty interesting. And it's not growth stage investing. Sure. So it's much less of kind of, let's say, kicking the tires on large financial statements and kind of almost private equity at diligence. It's much more thinking about the future with people that are still dreaming about it. And that's early stage. And so I think that was really compelling. I think the second piece of it that was compelling is it had a pretty strong geographic focus. And it had, a, and I think Upfront's been great at being long LA, um, putting our name out there in terms of associating ourselves with Los Angeles and having been here since kind of the initial dot-com boom. And so I wanted to join a team that had roots in town that would allow me to build a network here. Um, and Upfront was just honestly the right place in the right time. They were looking, I was looking, um, and the rest is history. That's awesome. Congratulations. That's, that's fantastic for sure. For sure. So you guys, you know, obviously based on what you just said, you cast a very wide net, obviously the LA focus do things nationally and internationally. I'm sure, you know, the deal flow is, is quite high. And so can you just walk us through, you know, investment decisions, right. And, and how you make those kind of from process to start uh, through the finish there uh, as well. I'm curious to learn a little bit more about that. Yeah, totally. So uh, as you were saying, Mike, we we invest across category and across geographies. Um, so we don't necessarily that is that is not often our our first restraint. We're many venture capitalists, right? It's like we yeah. only invest in let's say um, vertical SaaS in San Francisco, or we're only doing biotech in Boston, or we're doing you know consumer in New York. We're we don't really look at it in terms of that lens. As I was saying, for us kind of the timing and staging of a company is, is pretty important for us. And that's really the first filter, which is again, early stage investors, but we're, we're doing average check sizes of, I would say three to 5 million or average median within that probably being three and a half, four. Mm -hmm. and so it's really complex at that stage. So we're not necessarily doing what we, you know, it's called quote unquote seed or pre-seed rounds. We're really doing what we call like late seed, early A. Um, and so that's really the first parameter, right? Is would this make sense from a stage perspective in terms of for us to really lean in. Now, what we do at Upfront is we're very, we're, we're very bullish on the community, meeting people, building connections. And so we'll often meet founders kind of out of the guise of let's just get to know you, maybe not this round, but the next one. Mm -hmm. But when we're trying to think, move quickly in high conviction, that's the first parameter. In terms of how we go through the process, right? Um, what's, what's, what, we, what we talk about at Upfront is like, 
we are many different front ends to the same fund. And so what often happens is you might get introduced to myself, to one of the associates, or even to one of the partners based on your network, or maybe them spending time in an area. Um, and ultimately, there's a partner that will be your sponsor partner. But really what we're trying to evaluate is first and foremost, are you an upfront company? And so if you come to me and let's say you're building a, com uh, a company in cybersecurity, I'm not the expert at that at our fund, Kara and Spencer are, I would pass that off to you, but yeah. I pass that off to them. And so for us, kind of getting a sense of what type of company you're building, the business model and the category, we're pretty, we're pretty, quite great breadth, but there's partners that kind of just have superpowers in each of them. But how we, how we evaluate it, right, is first, okay, is this a, um, is this a, the right stage of company? The second is, is this a category that we can get to understand? Mm -hmm. So a great example is we don't invest a ton in, let's say, blockchain crypto okay. technology. Because yeah. there's folks out there that understand it way better than we do. And so for that, that would be something that pretty early in the process, we would probably decline on. If there is then kind of conviction around the category, um, what we then move into is we're a pretty high conviction team. And what that means is we don't often move incredibly fast and just make a decision, you know, in one meeting or two. We like to understand the facts. We like to understand the founders. We love doing diligence on customers, people they've worked with. We really want to understand these founders and these companies. And so we're pretty high conviction when it comes to diligence. Um, but what essentially will happen is a sponsoring partner and often an associate will kind of be doing the diligence to really vet it to the level of, we would now like you to actually pitch our partnership. And then you would most likely come in, in, a, in a previous world, right? In person, now on Zoom and kind of meet our partners, pitch us, we'd ask you some questions. But at that point, you're already pretty well qualified within the upfront pipeline. Um, and after that, we would kind of then make our definitive decision. And when we make decisions as a firm, again, every single deal, there's a sponsoring partner. We believe that accountability, um, that understanding of a vertical and expertise and matching that to upfront is really important. Though you're part of the family, we want you to have someone that will be your chief partner. And so that is important. At the same time, we are partners together as an investment committee. And so having a robust conversation, even though we don't understand a space as well as someone else is also really important. Got it. Got it. Okay. Now that makes perfect sense. I guess going back to that first part of that too, I mean, is, is one of the first tests too, to making sure like the entrepreneur has done their homework to get to the right person too, so that you don't have to pass them off. I would feel like that might be part of your screening process as well. Right. Totally. Uh, exactly. I, I think um, spending time on websites, looking at portfolio pages. Um, and if you have access to something like Crunchbase, just to understand what kind of is the range of investment, for venture capital is extremely helpful. Um, more often than not, you know, we have founders that will reach out to us that we'd be happy to have the conversation with, but if they can understand maybe a portfolio company that shows interest in this space, it's just so much more exciting for us. And so spending that time in terms of how are you, how are you crafting there might be a connection in terms of where we're spending time as a firm and where you are building a company and having alignment there is extremely important. And then to your second piece, Mike, of like finding people at a firm that spend time in a space, right? So yeah. for example, Greg loves consumer marketplaces yeah. and you can see that by his portfolio and background. Kara spends time in cybersecurity. Aditi spends time in FinTech. There's partners that have niches and spaces that have their corner. And so if you reach out to them, that's fantastic. I think the other thing to think about as well is um, we, we're very open to you know cold inbounds. Mm -hmm. Warm inbounds are also happy as well. And I would often leverage the community of people that you're close to. As we were saying, Mike, like LA is a big, small town. And so LA is pretty small. And if you can get on, on um, kind of on the, on the desk of some, up, uh, of some venture capitalists, they'll hopefully be very happy to find good partners for you within the ecosystem. Yeah, yeah, I've got, I have a question about that. We'll come back to that in a second too. Um, in terms of that, that due diligence process, like customer calls, et cetera, what do you think entrepreneurs are going to like most about that or least about that? Is it, is it the timing really, or just kind of, you know, diving into that as well? That's a great question. Um, I think, uh, I think the, the piece of it that they, they might not like, right, is we're pretty thorough. Uh, yeah. And I wouldn't say we're slow. When we, when we have high conviction on a deal, we will make sure we all right, are burning the midnight oil to get it done quickly. But we're, we're thorough. And what I mean by that is, Though we're early stage, we, we aren't really pre-seed where we can kind of just pretty quickly decide 250K here. We're lead investors. And so what yeah. often that means is we are the ones building conviction 
agnostic of other people saying we already want to invest in this. That conviction without signal from other investors just makes makes our process of diligence and, and kind of that barrier of entry a little bit higher. And so we really need to understand it. So what that often means is we want to speak to um, pilot customers or, or customers that you're working with, potential customers to understand the value. Um, I think the other piece of it is also is we want to under, we'll need to understand the market and the industry, right? And so we're going to want to talk to competitors. We're going to want to wrap our minds around the space and understand it deeply. And I think to, to, to the part we were talking to as well, if you're, if you're um, pitching us a company in a space that we understand, that ramp up is much quicker. But mm -hmm. often we want, part of this job is learning constantly. And so it's just gonna take us a little bit more time. And I think that timing piece of it, that's just the hard part of fundraising. You're like trying to you know, rattle, um, sure. corral all these people to kind of execute at the right time. And, and we understand that. And I think for us, we tend to be the lead investors. And so for us, we are less so, this, is gonna, this happens tomorrow. And so we need to backtrack our investment diligence to that. And it's more of what is the time that's required for us to invest and understand this deeply with conviction to be long-term partners? Do we have enough time for that or not? And if we don't, we often have to bow out. Got it. Got it. No, I appreciate that answer. That That's that's super helpful for sure. I think, you know, trying to turn that into a segue too, just in terms of the timing. So like just to, to wrap COVID around this too, I'm sure people are yeah. a little bit tired of hearing about it, right? But we had that situation like in the very beginning of the pandemic, right? Where if the, a founder hadn't started a, a fundraising process, yeah. it took them a lot more time to kind of get that over the hump. And finally, like in the back half of the year, you know, things really started to pick up there. But how has that kind of thrown uh, a wrench into the fundraising process, so to speak, or do you spend more time? I mean, it's hard to get to know people over Zoom. It can kind of be done. Um, what's your guys' stance on that in terms of, you know, deal execution as well? Yeah, totally. I, I think initially you were exactly right, Mike. Like there was a pretty big skepticism to start an entire fundraising process from having never met a person in person to doing it entirely by Zoom. Um, I would say, both the industry in general, um, as you can see, like there's a lot of deals getting done and, and those are obviously most of them being, if not all of them being pretty much remote. And for us as a fund, we've made um, a significant number of investments where it has been completely via Zoom. And I think the, the piece there, right, is, is a few fold. Um, our investment committees, which is kind of, you know, probably one of the last meetings that you'll have with us at Upfront, that is with many people. And that is, you know, via Zoom. But I think some of the pieces that might be missed is, understanding a little bit of um, people, understanding maybe a little bit of the EQ that happens in a room when, mm -hmm. when, a, when an entrepreneur is pitching us in terms of the confidence level that they have, maybe in terms of how deeply they understand things, how they can think about questions, um, some of the, some of, you know, maybe the harder questions that we have. That's hard to evaluate when you have a Zoom with, you know, 15, uh, 15 heads. Yeah. So what we tend to, tend to do is before that, um, there's a lot of Zoom meetings that we do where it's more, let's say, one-on-one, -on -one, two on one three-on-one, where we're meeting the entrepreneur in smaller settings where you can really try to engage virtually, which is, again, there's just the higher threshold of how do you make that a quality interaction. Mm -hmm. we, what, we've, what we've done is we've had to move quicker in terms of instead of, you know, let's find a day and you meet every single partner one-on-one, -on -one, let's get you on Zoom calls and let's do that before the partner meeting as well, because the partner meeting in terms of the investment committee, the interactions there, they're just not as rich, right? Sure. We can yeah. still, like there's still, a, there's still enough interaction for us to make the decision and as we've made. But I think for us, it, it just takes frankly, more flexibility in our partners and, on, and on, on the entrepreneur in terms of finding those kind of smaller, more intimate Zoom gatherings. And so I think that piece is, is pretty important. I think the second piece of it as well is like, in the past, um, conversations via Zoom were often, um, you wouldn't be looking at a presentation, right? You would be across the table. Sure. And yeah. I think oftentimes when, when I hop on Zoom calls with founders, it's like, let me share my screen, right? And, I, and I'm trying to interact with looking at a screen on my laptop while also looking at you. And so I think <laughs> having meetings where we yeah. look at the deck beforehand and it's all face-to-face -face has also been really value add, I think, for that interaction across both sides of the table as well. Yeah, candidly, I'm just, I'm jotting out some quick notes also on a, a dual screen too. So I, I can yeah. empathize with that. <laughs> totally, totally. Uh, that, makes, that makes perfect sense. Um, 
you know, and, and one of the things too, you said, because this is such a, a large fund as well, right? I mean, basic question there, but all the partners have to sign off before an investment I would uh, goes through. Is that correct? Or can a lead partner, you know, present that and then do it on their own? Or what's that kind of look like as well? Yeah, it's, it's basically right in between that, Mike. Okay. What essentially happens is there's a sponsoring partner that feels very strongly about deal. They're the ones that are, that are in, in a way saying, I, I am in favor of this. I have vetted this. I have high conviction about this. I would like to do this. I'm bringing it to the table. And then we all engage in a robust conversation. Mm -hmm. But really, it's, it's, it's less so an, of an explicit of like, okay, now let's go around the table, favor A or nay. It's not that. It's much more of a conviction and a conversation. Um, and so what often happens is we have partners, like every deal at a front, there's a partner that's championing it, that's championed it through the diligence process that wants to be a long-term partner, probably even sit on the board. At the, end of the, at the end of the day, the gravity of the decision and convincing the other partners, you know, in terms of hearing their feedback and, and um, being willing to take that feedback, both positive and negative, sits on the sponsoring partner. Got it. Got it. And so along those lines, too. So, I mean, I was talking about this with you yesterday. So this is... Uh, for the, the groups of companies in here, a unique opportunity too. In the years that we've we've done these, we've typically done them with with partners of VCs. I've spent a lot of time, you know, building networks with with associates too, and I know mm -hmm. value and the importance that they play as well. Uh, but I, you know, would love for you to just kind of talk about, you know, you mentioned like the four types of associates and in the roles that they play too, but. Um, talk about like your path with founders too, because I think that's also, uh, you know, unique to the associate role too. And I think it's also important as well. Yeah, totally. Um, if you think about what venture capital associates and analysts and, and sometimes even principals are doing at, at funds, usually one or two of four responsibilities. Um, the first responsibility is what we call sourcing, right? That's business development. That's essentially... Um, building connections in your ecosystem, trying to figure out, trying to fill the funnel as, as large as possible. So that's the first piece of it. The second piece of it is in the diligence, right? Which is the vetting and qualification of that funnel in terms of where are companies where we have decided we have an interest in, let us kick the tires on them, understand the business, understand the founders, and see if we, see if it's something that we want to, you know, bring to the investment committee. Then there's the third piece of it, which is we've decided to invest in a company, the actual investment finance and deal execution, right? That's everything from how do we think about term sheet and terms? To how do we make sure they, they get wired their money and it goes to the right bank account? Um, and then there's the last piece, which is we have invested in the company. How do we think about supporting our portfolio? Whether that be on specific strategic initiatives, whether that be on, you know, helping them um, prepare and practice their pitches, whether that's finding good folks in the network for them to look at, in terms of customers and clients or even you know future investors mm -hmm. so across those four diff different venture funds will have their associates probably specialize in one or the other so for me at upfront we have a pretty big portfolio because we have a pretty big fund so i am not nearly as portfolio focused as okay. i am on the earlier stage of things so i'm doing a lot of one two and three i'm spending a decent amount of time sourcing and for me when i think about sourcing right is uh, the lane that I've kind of decided is like, I'm very interested in kind of Southern California technology. So less so than going super deep in terms of uh, a vertical and understanding that vertical across the United States or even globally, or understanding, you know, a category and space and going really deep in it. For me, I've decided I want to understand Los Angeles. Um, and the other thing is, if you think about diligence, you have associates that understand space as well because they're spending time in diligence. And so what's, what's, what often is very helpful is actually figuring out how to get connections to associates because all the associates know each other. They all talk to each other. Yeah. That is a great way to almost have a less heavy of an interaction with a fund, to be honest. Like talking to me um, probably is going to be a little bit less daunting than let's say talking to Mark. Yeah. Um, yep. <laughs> but what often is helpful there is I, there are spaces that I know and, and, um, and, and I know the market kind of at my level and I can help pass or make introductions to other associates. So I think thinking about the fund and what type of associates they have is really important. And what you can do is honestly even just look at their LinkedIn. They're ex-operators. They're probably spending a lot of time with companies. Kind of their ex-consultants and bankers are probably spending more time in this middle. If they've been in venture for a while, especially in a region, they probably have really good sourcing chops mm -hmm. in that specific space. Um, so I would think about that. And I, and I think um, inbounding to, the other thing is that it's really dependent on the fund. 
right? Some funds are um, sourcing comes exclusively through the associates. They basically have associates that are that are essentially sourcing functions that are going out there and building the funnel. And sometimes it's the opposite, where all the sourcing comes to partners that are kind of thought leaders and putting content out there and letting it be inbound. Um, so understanding the fund, and honestly, you can often see that based on the makeup. If they've got, you know, a pretty big associate class, those associates are probably sourcing. If they have a pretty big um, partner cohort, like we do at Upfront, a lot of the partners are also getting pretty good deal flow as well. Yeah, and I think what's what's great about it too, just from my experiences as well as in with with the founders that are going through that, is you know associates can also quickly tell you like, hey, it's not a fit, and then help dish yeah. off to another fund, right? And so instead of running these, you know, uh, cumbersome kind of fundraising process, and maybe not leading to anywhere, you know, they can quickly tell you like, yay or nay, and then and then move totally. on. So I think 100%. You know, fundraising is a full-time job, right? So I think if you can make that uh, easier, the better there too, right? A hundred percent. Yeah. And partners, I mean, like, especially at Upfront, right? As lead investors, our partners are sitting on boards and, and yeah. spending a lot of time working with our portfolio companies um, and being, you know, valuable to them. And so finding time on the calendar and, and being able to just get on the phone to even vet to see if it's worth your time, is that is, that is invaluable. I, I think... What we try to do here at Upfront is if it's not a fit, we're not going to try and waste your time. Sure. As we know as, a, as an entrepreneur, the fundraising process is gruesome. It's yeah. long. I'm sure it's very emotionally tiring. And so if we can kind of not um, play smoke and mirrors and, and feign interest, and I can give you a quick signal of, hey, we're probably not interested in this because we don't understand the space or don't want to spend time in the space. We might be interested in this, but it might take us a little bit of time or this is perfect. Let me, you know, let me short circuit you, giving you that initial feedback as an associate, where that's kind of more of what I'm supposed to do on a day to day is going to be often very helpful for the entrepreneur. hundred um, percent. Switching gears just a little bit here, talking about LA and, and, and your focus in LA there too, and, and just the LA landscape. So uh, I was recently reading something that um, can't remember the source, um, but you know, journalism, we're not going to cite the source, right? So uh LA just overtook NYC as the second biggest VC market in the country for 2020 and just trailing the Bay Area now. And so, you know, from my time down there, it felt like for every two companies, there was a brand new seed stage fund getting formed. And maybe there's a little bit of consolidation in that, but it seems like things have really ramped there. What's leading to that maturity uh, just in that market specifically? Just curious about that. <clears throat> yeah, I think LA is a really interesting market. Um, compared to, let's say, San Francisco or even in New York. Um, I think one of the most important things is that very much is pretty ingrained in terms of the, the culture of the ecosystem is San Francisco is a tech forward city. Tech is the bread and butter. New York, tech might not be the bread and butter, but finances. If you think about Los Angeles, like we're known for entertainment. Sure. We're known for marketing. We're known for, you know, even things like fashion and TV. And so being not the chief industry in a place, I think is really fascinating from an incubation perspective. Because mm -hmm. oftentimes, yes, we are trying to find founders that have spent you know, time in tech and has worked, have worked in tech a lot. What we also see, which is pretty interesting in Los Angeles, is there are folks that have spent time in industries that have skill sets that can then, with the help of technology partners, or maybe even they are technical, they can disrupt industries that how do I say this? Isn't tech on tech on tech, right? What's pretty interesting in San Francisco is you can find SaaS companies that sell to SaaS companies that sell to SaaS companies. It, it turns a little bit abstract because tech is the main industry there. Yeah. In Los Angeles, it isn't. And a great example, right, is if you think about Los Angeles, you have Long Beach, which is one of the largest ports in North America. So there's a lot on logistics. Fashion is here. Um, and you've got, you know, inc incredible things around supply chain. You've got kind of the works of, you know, Quibi and things like that, which kind of are adjacent to media and entertainment. So there's a very interesting hodgepodge of talent, um, industries, and mature industries that are in Los Angeles. And I think that makes it pretty interesting from a funding perspective, right? LA is kind of, LA is, is known for having really strong consumer companies. And we've got great marketers here. Sure. So I think that piece is really, really interesting. And, and I think that is, um, that is allowed for, I think, Los Angeles to grow, but not to grow and just be a small San Francisco. It's pretty different here. Yeah. Um, that's the first thing. I think the second thing that's pretty interesting is like, 
people want to live here, right? Like the, the sunshine is great. Like, you know, especially in a COVID world, the amount of people that are, you know, leaving San Francisco, sure, for Austin, but a lot of them are coming to Los Angeles because it's a great place to live. And the other interesting thing that we see is, I think Los Angeles is one of the largest metros to graduate engineering talent in the country. I mean, if you think about from UCSB, you know, kind of used to UCSD and every state school and all the other colleges like Caltech and Harvey Mudd that are private, there's incredible engineering talent here. And in the past, what would you do is you would move to San Francisco because that's where tech was. Sure. What we see is folks that have spent time here that maybe are from here or even went to college here, they know how great the sunshine is. <laughs> they know how great the weather is. Sure, maybe they're a little bit. Damn, do we, is that me? In our portfolio of finding executives. Oh, did I lose you guys for a second? Sorry about uh, that. Am I back? Half a second. Yeah, we're back. We're back. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> uh, sorry about that. Uh, what I was saying, though, is, is folks that have spent time in Los Angeles, right, especially probably for their undergraduate, graduate degrees, and have gone to San Francisco, they know the quality of life that's waiting for them back here. It's pretty easy to recruit them. Um, so I think that's another big reason. It's founders, entrepreneurs, folks that have exited, venture investors want to spend time here in Los Angeles. Um, and I think that the, the third piece of it as well, um, in terms of if you think about, if you think about Southern California, um, it's pretty close to San Francisco. So it's easy to access, right? Like you can just hop on a flight. Um, and so I think thinking about it as San Francisco money coming to Los Angeles has been a pretty easy, I think, conceptual thing for funds to think about. It's like the founders are just, you know, uh, an hour and a half um, plane ride. That's sometimes, sure. you know, faster than driving down the 405. I can get down there, sit in the board meeting. And I think that access to it of literally ge geographically being so close to San Francisco has really helped it flourish. Nice, nice. Now I'm gonna flip that on its head and do a 180 on you here, but it's not a big curveball. So as, as you heard Dan say, uh, all of the presenting partners here are in the Pacific Northwest, right? And so- yeah. Another great ecosystem. You spent some time there. We actually have, if we look at the the registrations breakout of this, it was it was almost a record attendance. I think it might have been um, from people all over the country, right? And so, if we think about people that are you know like funding for a company and trying to get beyond their own little, not little, but local environment, right, and try to expand their network. You know, if you were to put yourself in their shoes, like what would be your approach to that? I mean, you guys do national investments. Um, you had that LA focus, but how can someone like that, uh, you know, from a Kansas City, Richmond, Virginia, um, you know, Green Bay, Wisconsin, someone like that, get on a, a radar of an upfront or some uh, a fund that has a national footprint there? Yeah, that's a that's a really good question, Mike. Um, and I think what's awesome is in places outside of the San Francisco, New York, and Los Angeles, some of these, and even Austin, some of these tech, big tech hubs, places like the Pacific Northwest or Miami, you know, or, or the Midwest are seeing um, tech hubs be built. I think that is awesome and fantastic. Um, I think it's refreshing. Um, but uh, what I would think about there is, I would always actually start with finding communities um, of investors, entrepreneurs, angel investors that are in, that are geographic focused. Because it, it, oftentimes that, that's the bread and butter. And then what I would try to do is I would, if you're trying to expand outside of that, I would think about category and space. So a great example is if you're a company that's, you know, um, let's say in Kansas, but looking at FinTech, then what I would look at is I would try and, and find what are, what are early stage FinTech companies um, that are out there and who's funding them. Yep. You know, and like, sure, they might be in San Francisco, they might be in New York, they might be in Miami, they might be in Seattle or, or Portland, but who are people spending time in our space? So a great example is up front, um, you know, we've announced this, but we invested in Claire, which is a FinTech company. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we're spending more and more time in FinTech as a, as a firm. And so if you're a FinTech founder, that's perfect, right? Like even if you're not in Los Angeles, Santa Monica, Southern California, California in general, that's probably something up our wheelhouse. And so spending time thinking about who are investors that are moving in the spaces that you're in is really, really important. And, and again, one way of doing that is looking at portfolio companies. And that's always important for an entrepreneur of who else is operating in my space, not just from a competitive standpoint. It actually can be very beneficial. 
because they're probably helping build ripples that you can ride off of, right? If they're having conversations with people, then they're like, oh, wow, you're the second fintech company in, in Portland I've talked to. That's awesome. Like, maybe we should spend time there. And the idea of generating interest around category, I think that piece is very important. And so understanding who are equivalents, and they don't even have to be at the same stage, right? Like, they might be later or mid-stage companies that have raised Series A's and Series B's, but figure out the venture funds that are spending time with other companies that are innovating in your category, and that's a great way of doing it. I would say that that, that is kind of that that's a pretty big piece of it. Um, I think the second piece of it as well is you can also kind of determine that based on content. Mm -hmm. If people are writing about a space, they're often writing about a space because they spent time in it, have kind of diligenced it, and now have content to put out there. And yep. so if you can find content that is adjacent to what you're building, that is helpful to what you're building, especially in terms of industry and category, those are probably the folks that you can target. Awesome. Yeah. And I think, you know, <clears throat> silver lining with COVID too is, you know, borders are dropped. Yeah. Right. So it's like, get out there, you know, hustle, send some cold emails too. Like that doesn't hurt, especially it sounds exactly. like you're always taking those too. And so, and then network with the other founders too, um, to try to get introduced that way as well. I think that's important too. Um, mm -hmm. And one thing there as well, Mike, like yep. one of the questions that I love that I think entrepreneurs should do it more, especially if you've been able to build rapport with an investor, you should ask them, who else should I be talking to? Mm -hmm. I frankly, I don't do that enough as, a, as an investor, but I should when I'm talking to entrepreneurs, right? Of like, hey, you're building something awesome and interesting. Who else do you know that's doing the same? I, I'll be honest, I should do that a lot more. But I think there's an opportunity for entrepreneurs as well. It's like, if you and I have a good conversation, it's a space that I understand deeply and maybe, you know, it's too early, too late, or just not the right fit for us. Or maybe even if it is, ask me. 100%. I think uh, I don't want to monopolize this too. So I, you know, I am going to turn it over to Q&A and gear that yeah. up. Um, but I will say this, just uh, uh, maybe a last question here too. Um, we've probably heard about this today already through just the, the talk that you gave, Josh, but a lot of founders are kind of keen on the value that they receive, you know, beyond the actual check itself. And it, yeah. it's still pretty clear to me, like what you get from that at upfront. But can you talk about like areas of, of where you add like disproportionate value there as well? Yeah, totally. I, I think what's um, pretty we're pretty adamant about the setup front and that is we're pretty involved long-term partners. And so oftentimes if, if you're looking for, let's say capital to fill out the remainder of a round or follow on a lead investor where mm -hmm. there isn't an opportunity for us to be kind of a, a pretty primary partner, um, it's often not a fit for us because it just doesn't, it just doesn't fit our, our, our bread and butter. And so we're very involved partners who are, are really thinking about how can we partner with you through times good and bad. Um, and so as I think about that, we've got a pretty interesting, um, we've got a pretty interesting platform and our, our, right, we obviously have a pretty good platform in Los Angeles, but if you think about it, it's more than like that benefit doesn't only go to companies that are in Los Angeles. What I mean by that is we've got, um, Carrie and Megan, Carrie's our head of marketing, Megan is our head of talent, and they have built incredible networks. Um, within Los Angeles, especially, but even nationally in terms of great marketers and folks that you can think of from a marketing perspective, great talent, whether it be everything from engineering and product to maybe even finance and sales. And we can bring LA talent to your company, right? Like that is, that's what we're invested in in LA is we're in, at Upfront is we're trying to build connections here in Los Angeles. And so maybe you're, you know, a company in San Francisco or maybe a company in, in Kansas City or Portland that's trying to find someone in Los Angeles, we can be really helpful there. And we think there's great talent in Los Angeles, by the way. I think there's incredible talent here. Um, a lot of it is going to San Francisco, but a lot of it is coming back. So I think that is a really important piece of it. I think the other thing as well is, um, if you think about the, the value of Upfront is, because we are involved partners, we're not just, um, we're not just gonna be there when you're asking for money. I think that's a big piece of it that, um, I've seen um, founders get frustrated at, and I've been frustrated at in terms of the industry where we like to hover around when things are good, but when it's bad, uh, we yeah. kind of, you know, maybe don't respond to calls as much and, and don't get on emails. And I think at Upfront, you will not get that. Um, we are partners, and, and the idea is like we invest as if we are partners, not because 
we're trying to put put options in every single company where we put 250K in 20 companies and maybe half of them were actually interested in it. And every company that we invest in, we're pretty high conviction. Mm -hmm. Yet we invest at an early stage. That makes us pretty unique. And I think the other thing is, um, right, we've, we've been in Los Angeles for a really long time. Like we're one of the oldest and largest VCs in Southern California. Um, at the same time, like Los Angeles is a strategic place like nationally and globally in terms of a ton of trade and things like that. And so we've got a pretty good network from the investing side, from the client and enterprise side, as well in terms of potential customers. Um, and so I think what you're getting at, at upfront is um, you're getting a lead. And, and what I mean by that is like, you're the one that's manning the, you're, you're the one that's, you know, manning the steering of, of the ship. Mm -hmm. You're going to have someone that, that's done it before and is going to be with you there, be, be with you there in the highs and the lows. That's awesome. No, I, I think that's, that's fantastic. Dan, I have uh, not been keeping up with the chat, but I want to give uh, all these founders, um, you know, Q&A um, time here too, just to make sure we can get that covered. <clears throat> yeah, so um, one question that, that's in both the chat and the, and the Q&A is how best to get in touch with you, Josh? Um, I know some VCs do not like to be emailed, that LinkedIn is away. Others are like, yeah, go ahead and email me. And when doing so, maybe you can give some tips in general. Uh, when you're doing yeah. cold outreach here, especially as we're all socially distant now uh, and not hopping on planes all that much or, or networking events, give some tips on, on how, to, how to build that rapport. Yeah, totally, totally. I, I think- um, And give your contact info because that, yeah, that totally. a lot of people are asking. <laughs> totally, yeah. So my contact info is pretty straightforward. I'm just- <laughs> that, That's <laughs> funny. Okay. <laughs> So uh, he'll come back here. I Shut think up, you've got it. You're, you're more than Josh, welcome to email Josh, me. Josh, you broke, you broke up there. You broke up there just as you were giving your contact information. It was comical. <laughs> Sorry about that. The best way to get um, to me is. <laughs> um, yeah, I, my, my emails are open. You can reach me at josh at upfront.com. Um, but in terms of tips and tricks, I, I think the first thing, like LinkedIn is very powerful. Um, and most associates are spending time on LinkedIn. Um, the perfect... The, the, the thing that I, I guess maybe as, as a pet peeve is if you send me a uh, friend re request on LinkedIn, a, a connection request, but there isn't any context, I have to, like, the digging has to happen on my end, right? I have to go to your profile. I'm then looking at your company. I don't know what, I maybe can determine from LinkedIn what your company does or doesn't. But basically what I'm looking for as an associate is I want to understand what stage you're at, what geography you're in, what category are you building in? And really what, like, wh and what specifically are you building? With that, I can, the way I think about it is for me specifically, how I think about it, companies and what is an upfront company or not that I'm interested in personally, I can't really explain it to you on paper. It's more like Pandora, right? I listen to something, you give me something, I can tell you like, yep, this is interesting, this is not. You send me something else, I can tell you it's interesting or not. I, if you can give me as much information on the inbound, I can basically quickly give you an answer of like, yep, let's hop on a call right now. Awesome, like send me an email and answering X, Y, and Z or like, hey, this is awesome, like, you know, but this is probably not something we would invest in. Let me just be upfront with you so we don't, you know, waste anyone's time or, or get you too excited. So I think having the entrepreneurs provide information to me, you don't need to, please don't write an essay, right? But just give me the salient points, maybe even throw in a pitch up there. That is incredibly helpful. I think warm intros, Usually, though cold intros work, they, they, they honestly do work, warm intros are always better. So if you can find people in your network that are going to be your champions and can provide a warm intro to another investor, that always works because there's also the social pressure, right? If Mike sends me a company, I'm, I, I'm going to make sure, like, I need to respond not only for the entrepreneur, but I, I need to build my, keep my rapport with Mike. And so doing a, a warm intro is always better than cold. But in terms of cold, having that information, having it salient, having it quick, is really, really important. Um, and I frankly can tell if someone's done their research based on that. If you're a company raising 50K in cryptocurrency, you know, we don't do that at upfront. And it's pretty obvious to, to tell that. And so what it makes me feel like is it makes me feel like you're just DMing me and 50 other people and there isn't a reason why. So I guess part of it is, is, is tell me the why. Why upfront? Why, why us? Why even me? Um, so yeah, that, that would be some of my tips. Awesome. I'm just going through here. 
Quick one uh, from Michael, long board or short board? <laughs> um, I am, Michael, I'm pretty bad at surfing, I would say, relative to, to most people that, especially the folks here in Southern California, but I, I'm long board. Gotcha. Um, yeah, I'm not good either, so I stick with long board. <laughs> I wish, I wish, I wish I could rip a short board, but not yet. Maybe one day. <laughs> the, um, okay. So there was a couple ones in here. Oh, talking about, um, metrics for seed series a, you know, you guys are in check size three to 5 million, but what are you looking at from like a revenue, you know, customer acquisition costs, maybe, you know, just things like that. Just quickly going through that too. That's a great <laughs> question. Um, this really depends on business and business model. Sure. And what I mean by that is like, if it's a, if it's a space that we have high conviction in and that we understand, we're not looking for the metric. We're looking for the idea. So if it's, if it's a space that let's say upfront familiar with, it's a space we've invested in before, let's say it's a space that we've just, we've gone pretty deep with certain companies and maybe just haven't made the investment yet for us, we're less than looking for the metrics. What we're looking for is we're looking for the business model and the founder that is compelling. Then there's other spaces that maybe we haven't spent as much time in. You know, we don't know it like in the back of our hand. Then that's really when metrics come in. And I would say for, for metrics there, right, is like what we want to see is, yes, we want to see growth. Like we want to see revenue. I, I'll, I'll be honest. We do not have like a threshold. It's not like, oh, you're above a million or half a million of ARR. Like we'll look at you like not yet. Um, often when, when investors are telling you this metric isn't high enough, like they're basically giving you a reason to tell, to tell you that they don't have conviction yet. And I think metric, like metric based conviction is a different type of investment, which is, Hey, I think this often what that is, is like this model might work. I'm not positive. It, I'm not positive. This is the model. Convince me otherwise. Convince me otherwise with growth that I can't ignore. That, that would be it really. If I have conviction, if we have conviction in a, in a founder in a space, like, yes, we, we don't want to see metrics that are, you know, going to, to make us scratch our head in terms of skepticism, but we're, we're early stage investors. And so we're, we're making bets still on founders and ideas and high conviction team. And so I would say that that's really the big piece of it um, yeah. is oftentimes it's like, frankly, it's like we have conviction about the business and the category and the business model where we are, we, we're, we're likely to invest kind of regardless of metrics or it's just a space that we're not super comfortable and familiar with. And so we need to be convinced otherwise and metrics is a great way of doing that. Got it. Got it. Okay. That's perfect. Um, Dan, you were going to say something real quick. Sorry. Yeah. I mean, we're coming up to, to, um, to an hour here. Um, and so we're going to stay on and do a few more questions here, but I know many people have to have to log off. Uh, they've got other meetings coming up. Um, so I just wanted to do a quick round of thank yous before, before we go into overtime. Um, to our partner group here today, and I apologize for the background noise. We have wonderful emergency services here in Santa Monica. Um, it's a great place to live and build a tech business. Uh, but now I want to thank our partners. Uh, and I, and I want to thank Josh for coming on here again. We're going to stay around here, but, but giving us this time and your insights uh, is wonderful and your contact info uh, so that people can, can reach you. Uh, to, to everyone out there attending who has to leave, uh, it will be recorded. Overtime is recorded as well. Uh, and, and our webinars are available on our YouTube channel and we'll send out the link uh, for that uh, in a few days, either tomorrow or Friday. Um, so with that, Let's go into overtime here as, as we approach uh, the one hour mark. And, and I have a question for you, Josh. Um, you know, I spent most of my life as an entrepreneur and, and even pre-pandemic, it was pretty lonely. Uh, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, a tough, it's a tough journey um, and, and it can be quite stressful and, and really challenging on your mental health. And I think for the last year, we've all had a bunch of other challenges uh, on our mental health and wellness. Um, as an investor working with entrepreneurs, give us your thoughts and maybe some things that Upfront does um, to go beyond the, the value add of, of a great platform that you guys have built, but, but some of the personal relationships and guidance and coaching that you personally and that, you're, that you're part, your partners bring to the mix. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that's a, a great point, Dan. It's, um... The journey of entrepreneurship, I, I frankly have never done it, but I'm sure it's a lonely one. I'm sure it's a very, very lonely one. And I think at a front, we're investing in great companies. 
right? We're investing in great business models. We're investing in great ideas. But at the end of the day, especially at our stage, we're looking for partners and high conviction partners and teams. And so we're invested in we're invested in having our founders, not only our founders, but the you know the people that are that are um, in in the companies that are, our founders are leading to be at at their best. And when I say at their best, I don't mean like the most efficient, right? Like, I don't mean like staying up at 3 a.m. to, to re reply to our emails. Um, I think what we are looking for is we're looking for people um, that are doing what they love, right? You've like, we kind of, we kind of, we ask often why people build companies and hopefully you have this incredible itch to see something in the world and you haven't seen it the way you see it and you want to bring it forth. And so having the mental health having the um, even grace for yourself, having the people around you that are supporting you, including our partners that are allowing you to do this out of passion is very, very important. We're not like, that's the other reason why we're long-term investors. We're not looking just to throw money cash on cash on someone that wants to sell a business tomorrow and makes a quick buck. We want people that have product vision. We, we want founders that have product vision. And so for us finding people that have that type of a conviction first is important. And then the second thing to your point, Dan, of like making sure our interactions with them are not only pleasant. I think that's, that's, that's an interesting thing with VC, right? Is like, people are just like, oh, let's just, I just wanna end, end this interaction with them, like not disliking me. That shouldn't be it. Like we should be generous with our time. We should be generous with our advice. Like can we, can our interactions with us as partners with you as a potential entrepreneur or as an actual entrepreneur, leave you feeling more passionate about what you're building, maybe even more refined in your thesis. Like that is really, really important to us. So I think first and foremost, that's it. The second piece is I think it's very important for our founders to be in community, not just with other investors, but with other founders. That's really, really important to us. You know, we um we do things like the upfront summit where we have certain days where we invite, you know, certain founders of our portfolio companies to connect because Again, this journey is lonely, all right? But no, like, no person is supposed to be an island. And so building community um, amongst our founders at Upfront, I think is really, really important. Uh, but first and like, most importantly, right? I, I think technology is, um, I think technology might sometimes be known as an industry that cares about efficiency too much. And sometimes we need some grace. And I think that is, um, if we lose that, then truly we're just robots. Well said. I agree. Let's see. I'm going to quickly go through here. Oh, going back, um, this was a great networking question that I skipped. So how should people just kind of be cognizant about your time and trying to build relationships with you when uh, without the expectation necessarily of like desiring future funding at this moment in time or like how to kind of, you know, yeah. I guess hold the line at that point. Right. Cause I'm sure the great conversations are the ones where it's not desperation for funding, <laughs> so, uh, but, but also just to be respectful of, of both parties times there too. Yeah. That's a, 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 a great question. Um, I, I think that the, the first piece of it there is, um, understand that like at the end of the day my my i am working on things that are very time-based and so if i can if you are maybe wanting to connect and you know just just talk about something giving me a little bit more of hey can we not meet tomorrow but maybe could we meet in a week or two or three or even next month that very quickly signals to me okay this person isn't just trying to get like as much of my time as quickly as possible like this person just wants my, you know, wants to pick my thoughts on something or maybe has something interesting to share. And I think the idea of like, when you're introducing yourself to someone, when you're networking with someone, the idea of the urgency is, is really, really important. I think oftentimes, I, you know, I get folks from LinkedIn where it's like, it's just too early for us, but I'm very interested in hearing what they want to build. That for me, frankly, um, I, I, I can't always do those tomorrow because often I'm chasing deals or have other priorities. And so I think, Having a little bit of grace for the, for the venture capitalists in terms of scheduling things out is great. And the other thing is like, that will be a pretty good determinant of if the venture capitalist is like, hey, this is interesting, like, sorry, you know, 
or like they don't even respond, like they're probably not really trying to network, I guess, if that makes sense. If they don't really try, they don't even try to respond, like sending them four other emails, like probably isn't gonna be very helpful. Persistence is important. But um, if you can find someone that's willing to engage on email, and sure, it might not be the right fit for that investment, just toss it out there of like, hey, you know, there's not as much urgency in this, but would you be down to, you know, have a Zoom coffee or, you know, walk through my deck or, or something like that, in, you know, in, in a few weeks? That gives me a lot more relaxation of like, awesome, this person isn't just trying to monopolize my time. And I can give them time on my schedule where I'm not in between meetings, you know, like trying to um, do a, a Zoom call where I'm trying to eat lunch in between right, two 15 minute meetings. Like I can sit down and be present with them. So often it is like giving, asking for the right amount of time and priority for someone based on the importance of it. Awesome. Uh, that makes perfect sense. Uh, let's see. There's been a lot of chats about um, the idea of uh, quite literally idea versus team and, and where you yeah. played in that. And so, you know, obviously the conviction of the founders, you've talked a little bit about that, but maybe just shedding some light on that would be great too. <laughs> Yeah, totally. I, it, it is both, right? I, I think um, if you have a, I would say team is the um, team is the necessary. Yeah, you've got a great idea, but it's not the right team. We won't invest. Entrepreneurship is a hot space right now, um, and if you've got a great idea, there's going to be people following. Sure. And so having the great team to execute against the idea is really, really important. So for us, like, if you don't have a great team, great idea isn't enough. Great team is, is a requirement. Sometimes we will make bets in teams that are so great. It's like, they might pivot. Like maybe we even expect them to. It might be an exploratory. But this is a team where there's dynamics and there's conviction in terms of just maybe certain business functions that they're good at where it's like, we want to we do that with the team. Gotcha. Um, right, I think... Greg Bettinelli has some incredible medium posts about pivoting. And so that's when, right, you've got to trust the team and the partners you've invested in. At the same time, like, I think what's, what we see often in venture capital is great teams without any idea raising like that. Yeah. And that is um, a, a sad part of our I industry, which is like, we've fished from the same pond mm -hmm. and we've realized we can, get, we can get good fish there and we've gotten lazy. And so in, in the, um, under the, the, the virtue of efficiency, we've decided to just fish at the same pond over and over and over again. That's not any good. Yeah. We, we tend to not want to do that at our front. We don't think that is the smart way of doing it, the equitable way of doing it. And that perpetuates a lot of the problems of what we see in terms of diversity and inclusion in this industry. Gotcha. Uh, Dan, did you have one? Sure. So, so upfront is investing after there's some other people on the cap table. You guys will get in fairly early. Um, you'll do some seed investments, um, but you're probably centered on Series A, and then you've got the capital to be able to be following on on, on Series B and Series C. As an entrepreneur, you're always thinking about how do I, how do I raise capital? How do I raise that first dollar of capital? Um, and, and there's some questions around crowdfunding and maybe what the yeah. view is as a VC coming in later, but even making that more general, how concerned should uh, entrepreneurs be about what their cap table looks like when they're coming to pitch to you for $250,000 or $500,000 seed round check or Series A? Um, how important is it what their cap table looks like with their angels and or crowdfunding? Yeah. That's a, that's, a, that's a great question, Dan. I think um, what your cap table can tell about you is it gives us signal. If you've got great angel investors, right? If you've got some of the great really early stage funds in town, like a mucker on your cap table, that's just great signal for us, right? Because it means someone else earlier than us, um, before we would entertain it, has looked at this, has deemed it worthy of investment. And so I think that is not a requirement at all. We're not like, oh, if you, you know, didn't invest from X, don't have an investment from X, Y, and Z, we won't look at you. That's not it at all. But for us, I think that's important. That's like the cherry on top. That's great signal for us as investors. So I think first and foremost, that in terms of crowdfunding specifically, to be very honest, in the world that we operate in, it's not that common. And I 
I don't think that's a good thing. I think alternative um, access to capital that is A, not as dilutive and B, giving more access to this um, capital product besides people in venture capital and LPs is fantastic. You just haven't seen it yet because it's still so cutting edge. I hope that changes. Uh, but honestly, in the world that we operate in, like things that have been kind of established, like the Kickstarter and things like that, or even some of the things like Equity Zen that are trying to build non-dilutive early equity, we honestly don't see it that often yet, but that's going to change. I do think that's going to change. I think the, 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 the piece of it that kind of has negated that in the past, right, is there's very prolific, especially on the West Coast, very prolific angel investor network and syndicates, right? Things like, let's say, Tech, tech Coast Angels or something like that. And so oftentimes, um, those, are the, those are the folks that um, are, are investing in companies that a venture capital fund would eventually invest in. And so those folks are, are kind of targeting that type of a, a, an investment before it gets to us versus, let's say, something that is more of a, a crowdfunding. Again, that might change. Um, and I, I'm really hoping that does change. Um, and then I think the, the other piece of it as well, then, is thinking about dilution. If you've already given up a lot of dilution, every single round that you take in venture capital that's equity is diluted to the founders. And for us, since we are thinking, we are investing in teams, we want our teams to be incentivized with equity. And so if you've really given up a large amount of dilution already in prior rounds, it's going to be harder for us to really want to invest because most likely we'll invest not only a first check, we'll probably invest two, three, maybe even four, right, based on the exit. Um, and so that's the other thing to think about as well, is dilution. We've got time for one more. Josh, what are you just the most excited about? It could be a company, yeah. it could be a vertical, just take us home. <laughs> I, I think... Um, so I, I think the beauty of technology, and if we miss this, would be a tragedy. Is um, technology should not only be ethical, and what I mean by that is I think ethical assumes that the world is naturally good. There's entropy in the world, and like there are, there's a cost to technology, and I think what is the most exciting for me is technology that is not ethical in terms of I just don't want to make the world more chaotic. Yeah. I don't want the world um, to be, you know more evil but it's more of how can we build things based on what we've learned from technology what we've learned from innovation to actually redeem things and make them better so a great example is i think fintech is incredible i think the ability for fintech to provide liquidity of money to take down payday loans access to credit to take down historically you know pretty um bad credit behavior things like that are so incredible because what you're building there is you're building companies um, where venture capitalists aren't the target customer. And those are the most interesting to me. And when, when you have a founder that is building something like that, you often find that they have pretty high conviction. And that's really when, that's really what gets me excited is a founder that has, a, has this vision for the world. And it's not just, I can build a great company and it's not going to, excuse my language, but screw anyone over but this is a great company. And not only is it going to help my customers, like this is, this is going to bring lasting change to people's lives. And so FinTech is a, is a great example like that. I think one of, one of the companies I'm most excited about in our portfolio is Claire, which is providing earned wage access, right? To hourly workers. So. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Very cool. Well, hey, Josh, this was great. Thank you so much for, for your time and your insight. This was, uh, this was a lot of fun. So Really glad to have you on here. And, and I hope the rest of, of everyone else who got to attend enjoyed it. But if you didn't or you had to leave early, you know, we're going to follow up with everyone with a recording of this so you can share it amongst your networks. And uh, yeah, Dan, any, any last words here too? No, again, thanks to our partners, attendees. We do yeah. these every month. The next one will be on March 10th. Um, and we'll have a, a, a Latinx uh, kind of bend to it as we have uh, an investor uh, from a Peruvian based venture capital firm, but doing investing internationally and in the US. Uh, we also have an event next week with one of our partners, Celeprise, which is the leading B2B SaaS uh, accelerator uh, that runs programs in New York, San Francisco, Toronto, and they're expanding as well. Really great if you're an early stage startup in that space to check them out. Uh, but our event is with the CEO and founder of Bento Box, 
uh, talking about how they pivoted their business over the course of the last year due to COVID-19. Should be fascinating. Um, so that's up on our website and you can register for that. Josh, thanks again. Everyone, thanks for joining us and we'll see you again soon. Thanks. Thanks, Bye -bye. everyone. Take care. Thank you, everyone.